Hi, I'm Will, now officially being recorded. Um, right. And yeah, so this is this talk is a synthesis of my research philosophy. Uh, and to get into it, I want to start with a little vignette about how uh, I, I got into this line of research. Because I think for some people, like when you get into a research field, it might be because you have this really inspiring mentor, you have this really deep problem that you like to work on. But for me, I had this like, it's like Joker moment several years ago, where I'm, I'm thinking like, how do we live in a society like this? And it starts with the following headline. I read this press release that said, we've created the first intuitive programming language for quantum computers. And I read this and my jaw just dropped. I was like, wow, could it be? Had they really made quantum programming intuitive? That's amazing. And so imagine my confusion when I go find the closest person next to me and I show them this language and they don't immediately get it. I'm like, what would a university press release lie to me like that? That's insane. But they, and they even say this in the paper, uh, this is my PLDI paper two years ago, like that they created the first quantum language with quote unquote intuitive semantics. And unless facetiously, you know, this is an instance of a trend I have observed really across the spectrum of computer science which is you can find designers of computer systems making these deeply cognitive claims about the stuff that they're making. Like they'll say a language has intuitive semantics, or you might say uh, a system makes it easy for users to reason about performance bottlenecks. Or you might say that like one distributed system consensus algorithm is more understandable than another. Uh, by the way, is the screen readable? Should be, okay, just making check, making sure. And an issue, though, in all of these papers, these are all real public papers written by real academics, but I don't think they have methods that are really expressive enough to demonstrate these claims. And so, for example, I'll show you quotes from the evaluation section of each of these papers, which is the point where these authors sat down and said, okay, we have to convince a reviewer two that our paper, you know, actually satisfies these things we're saying about our system, and they say the following. So the quantum programming language is more intuitive because on average, it, the programs in their language were shorter than in a competing language, fewer lines of code. Uh, but personally, I don't think this is a great metric for intuitive. Like if you give me a big Java program, I can give you a Haskell program that is three times smaller and 10 times as hard to understand. So this is not great for measuring intuition. Uh, for the performance-oriented system, they showed that this particular thing could correctly model a particular outcome, like it could spit out a reasonable number, but there wasn't even a human involved in the evaluation. There was nothing to show that a human would use the system to gain an understanding of performance, but rather just an algorithm could correctly compute something. Okay, and the consensus algorithm one is actually even more interesting because what they did is they... Uh, so, so the, the setup here is they had this algorithm for, for having multiple machines try to agree on a set of values. And there was this existing implementation called Paxos that was widely used. And then they had this alternative RAF that they thought was more understandable. And so to demonstrate this, they developed an entire lecture series for both of these uh, distributed consensus algorithms that were meant to be largely isomorphic to each other, module of the specifics of each algorithm. And then they got graduate students at Stanford and Berkeley, they gave them both of these courses, it is between subject intervention, and then evaluated them on these post-test scores to see, oh, after we've taught them about each thing, are they doing better on one versus the other? And like, after all of that work, like months and years of planning, the end result was they found a five point increase on you know one test versus another, which you might look at and say, oh, that doesn't seem, okay, five points higher on a test, that doesn't seem that important. But this algorithm is huge. Like if you talk to anyone in the industry doing distributed computing, they all know RAF because they all agree that this is more understandable than the competing consensus algorithm. And so, you know, to that end, these are not like bad papers. It's just, I think they don't have access to a body of methods to really talk about or justify the intuitions that, the, that these system designers have. And so early on in my PhD, uh, I saw these kinds of problems recurring so often that I said, okay, somebody must have something to say about this, right? What, what would I do if I was in the setting of each of these authors? It, is there a body of techniques? And naturally, of course, the HCI community was a good place to look. And so I set out to learn from the HCI experts there was very conveniently this uh, nice cover feature that y'all might all actually be interested to read called Programmers or Users 2, Human-Centered Methods for Improving Programming Tools by some very notable people in the HDI space. 
And so if you read the article, you dig in, they have this big old table of methods of all the different ways you can incorporate HDI into the design of your programming tools. And really, if you boil them down, I won't make you read the table, uh, it's these three things, which is first, you need to find users, then you need to get them to use the, your, your system, your tool, and then you like observe them using it, you analyze that data, you iterate, you do all these things. Um, but I'm punting a lot to part three because it's really the first two that get you in trouble. For advanced programming systems like quantum programming languages, distributed consensus algorithms, all of these sorts of systems, uh, it can be very difficult to find users. They might be very expensive. You might, there might only be a dozen quantum programmers in the entire world. And then once you have to actually get them to use your system, like, well, okay, now you need all the, the IDE support, the, the documentation, the tooling, you know, you need these people to invest a lot of time. Like the, the sort of canonical HCI model, like we type papers in these things, is we do user studies of the granularities of hours. Like I'm gonna bring people into my lab, I'm gonna have them use my tool for one hour, plus maybe 15 minutes of instruction, and then I'll see if it helped them do something, right? But most meaningful design decisions and programming systems really only show themselves at the time scale of like weeks or months or years and at the scale of ecosystems, right? Not individual people. And so there's a big disconnect between the intuitions guiding these sorts of system design decisions and what sort of methodologies you might find in HCI that can really uh, try and justify those decisions. But even if you do get people to use your system, you then have to like understand from your observations what you're seeing and then use that to inform the system design. So you have to pick the right tasks. You know, you have to, a, a very common issue I've heard from people is they bring them in to evaluate their research system and they get all those like little great, like nitty criticisms of the smaller things like the bad error messages or whatever. But then they never really understand the high level concept you're trying to test of whether, you know, this particular thing would make something easier to debug or not, for instance. And so, the, the sort of idea here is that the, the classic HCI response of just find real humans and work with them is not always a practical approach for designers of advanced programming tools. And so what then can we do instead, right? We can't find all these people and train them and so on. And the idea is what if you could predict how a person would interact with a programming tool before you ever had access to that person, right? That may, that may seem to be impossible to do in its entirety, like you probably believe in free will, but I think the idea is we can at least predict aspects of the human behavior, of the user's behavior. And this is the question I've been thinking about for well, know, the last five years, a long time now, which is how can we use theories of human behavior to design and evaluate programming tools? And so by theories, I'm referring to evidence-based causal explanations of how people work at almost any level of cognition to anything higher than that. And this is a big question. Uh, my goal in this talk is to show you that it is both possible and useful to work towards an answer. And specifically, I'm gonna focus on two layers of cognitive theory. So the first is about kind of low level cognitive resources, the building blocks of cognition that we use for higher level problem solving. Uh, and this is the work that I've done during my PhD. And then I'm also going to talk about high level aspects of cognition, like mental models, how people form conceptions of programming ideas. And this is relevant to my current research, which is about making the Rust programming language easier to learn. Okay, and so let's dive in. And to talk about cognitive resources, I want to start with a relatively simple question. So here is a Python program. And the question I have is, how would a person trace this program? And by trace, I mean, in your head, no pen and paper, your goal is to compute the value of the last variable Z. And I want you to think about this. And this is an interesting question because it feels something that's like very simple and constrained. If, if a theory could not at least predict something as basic as this, then what, how could a theory try and predict anything more interesting? This is, this is kind of where I started uh, early on in my PhD. And so uh, I'd actually like you to take a second, feel free to talk to your neighbor and, and make, build a theory. What is your theory of how somebody, yourself or others, would try and compute the value of Z in your head? Go for it. Okay. 
and then like and then you have to like go back and find which Okay. <laughs> See, I love this. This is theory building at work. You know, everyone's everyone's generating ideas. I, this is my favorite part. Um, before I hear your answers, I want to show you something. So we ran an experiment where we actually showed people programs like this, and we would track their attention as they read the program. And so what this graph is showing is this is one person reading this actual program and doing the same task. And what each uh, blue dot is them spending at least 300 milliseconds looking at this particular line of code. So they started off looking at this variable, then went to this variable, they went down to here, then here. They went back up and down and back and up and that very zigzag pattern. And so the question I want you to think about now is, is that this is data, right? This is real data taken from a real human. Is this consistent with your theory, right? You just formed some intuitive idea of how someone might trace this. Does your theory explain this data? And so just by a show of hands, who, who would have guessed something like this? Is this within your theory? Okay, half the room, and then how many know this is, this is inconsistent with your theory? Okay, another half the room. So for people for whom this is inconsistent, what alternative theory did you have? Shout it out. I look at the equation first and trace back to get the valuable value. As in you start here and you follow, oh, I need to see E, so you go there first, for instance, and then you see an NEK, you go here. No, I first check if there's any valuable that I still need to calculate to get that. So I see that there is a K, so I go back to K mm -hmm. and see that I need um, B for K. So I go back to calculate B and then like going back to K. Right. Yeah, that's cool. And so I th that does seem like intuitively an alternative strategy, right? You can kind of read from top to bottom or you can read from bottom to top. And I think these were the ideas that really stimulated this initial experiment, which is can we characterize like the space of variation and how people would approach this problem. Because on some level, it feels very mechanical. Like there's not a lot of creativity involved in, in doing this specific task on this specific program. And so there should be a systematic process that people follow and that could explain why we see this, these data points, right? And so to get into that, if it's a mechanical process, it has to do with kind of cognitive machinery. And so we, we need to understand a little bit like, uh, or we need a cognitive model of how people would read this kind of program. And I think we can start off by going to classic HCI. So this is a figure from the Psychology of Human Computer Interaction, great Cardin Renewal, 1993 textbook. Um, and it's uh, essentially, they, they propose this model of how people would interact with a computer based on lots of experimental data taken from various forms of cognitive psychology. And the idea is like when you're interacting with a computer, say you were reading that program, data comes in through your eyes, it gets perceptually processed and then reaches what's called a working memory. So working memory is a temporary store of information where you can hold individual facts in the short term. Some of those may get stored in your long-term memory. And then these memories then get passed down to your cognitive processor, like the rest of your brain, which then decides what to do, hands an instruction off to your motor processor, like maybe typing on a keyboard or writing something down and that heads to your extremities. And what's notable about this model uh, is that we can make fairly precise predictions about the parameters of this model. So for instance, we know how long a saccade of the eyes will take or how long it might take to respond to a change in stimulus. And most relevantly for this talk, we actually have pretty tight bounds on how much information uh, or how many things you can hold in your working memory. So what I mean by that is, uh, let's say I gave you a task, which is I'm gonna read out loud a series of digits. So I say like four, two, eight, one, three, four. And then I say, okay, say that back to me, right? You don't have to do that. Uh, but if I did do that, then 
empirically across all of humanity, people cap out around usually about six, six-ish digits. Like you may have heard the term seven plus or minus two as a famous working memory limitation. Um, today it's more like four plus or minus one. But the point is, is that for that task of like remembering that sequence of digits, everyone is bad at it, everyone. Uh, you can technically get better, but you don't actually increase the size of your working memory. You just use very clever strategies to remember groups of numbers, like how you remember a telephone number as being sort of three segments of numbers, then uh, 10 consecutive digits. And so this is one of, I, I think, the most foundational and important observations in all of cognitive psychology, especially to us as designers of computer systems. Like the fundamental limitation that humans have in cognitive work is remembering information in the short term. And so when you're looking at a big problem or when you're trying to think about a tricky programming issue, there's only but so much you can keep in your head at a given period of time. You naturally have to spend, and then you have to very carefully work with your tools, your environment, your pieces of paper, externalizing your knowledge to deal with these working memory limitations. And so throughout my PhD, I've been interested in this question of how do working at memory limitations influence our ability to program? And my hypothesis for this specific task is that the main challenge in doing this style of tracing would be working memory limitations. That the thing that would explain why there's say so much zigzagging here in this case is probably because this person is revisiting code they've seen before since they forgot the value that was there, which seems somewhat intuitive, right? Like this is a fair amount of data to keep in your head at once, especially if you're trying to track, you're trying to simultaneously follow where you are in the program, track all the current values of things, and also you know, follow them back to the, these locations you just were. That's a lot of information to hold at once. And so we did this experiment to generate the data I showed you where we gave people this interface. Uh, you can't really see it on this, this monitor, but we had these random seven line programs that consisted of single letter variables assigned to either constants or expressions. And then to do the kind of pseudo eye tracking, when somebody hovered over a line of code with their mouse, it revealed the right-hand side of each expression. And so we, this was like a, a COVID safe eye tracking study more or less that we could run on Mechanical Turk. And we gathered data this way on, you know, we said compute the value of that last variable and we could see where people were attending to at any given point in time. We, we did 150 trials over 15 participants. And the thing that we looked at is how often did people revisit code? Because our intuition is that if you ever look at a line of code more than once, that is indicative of a working memory failure because you've already seen this information before and you're retrieving it again because you've lost it or didn't try to remember it in the first place. And this is the data distribution that we saw. So this box plot shows the uh, each data point is for a given one of those traces, the number of times that somebody revisited code they had seen, they had, uh, seen before. And the median for these seven line programs was 11 revisits ranging from zero which is like a perfect, you had no memory issues, you went from the first line all the way down to the last line with no problems, to 43 times where you're like continually bouncing around this code and it can take you upwards of several minutes even to accomplish this basic task. And so this is fairly strong evidence that uh, even for the most simple task you can imagine, right, people are constantly revisiting code because they just cannot store that much information in working memory. And to the theories that we built earlier, it gets more interesting when we consider the relationship between working memory and the strategies that people choose to trace these programs. And so consistent with all of the theories that were generated earlier, we observed two basically different ways that someone would choose to compute uh, to trace this program. So one we call linear tracing, where you start at the top and then you basically go down and then you jump back up when you forget something. So you would say, okay, you know, go to this computation, and then I forgot what H was, so I go back here, go to the next computation, but then I forgot something, so I have to go back here. Or sometimes you just go straight down because you, don't, you remembered everything and have no problems. But the alternative would be what we called on-demand tracing, where you start at the bottom, like B is equal to O plus S, and then you go to O, and then you go to S, and then you follow the data dependencies, the, the data flow structure of the program. Question? Okay. And so... This, uh, we found pretty robust data that people tended to pick one of these two strategies and stick to it. And I think these strategies are interesting, particularly because they will change the nature of how you're using your working memory as you solve this task. So for example, when you're tracing on demand, this thing you're storing in your head is variable value pairs. 
I have to remember H is three. Like that's a factoid that now exists in my memory as I go down to read the rest of the program. And so when I get here and I forget what H was, I have to look up that variable definition. So there's a form of information that is stored in memory and there's a specific procedure by which you recover that information. And that is distinct in the on-demand case where, oh, uh, I'll get this to the chat in a second. And that's distinct in the on-demand in the on -demand case where if I say went from B equals O plus S to O to S from S to C, and then I say, wait, how did I get here, right? The thing you're remembering is not variable value pairs, but rather the sort of like visited program locations in the data flow graph that you've mentally reconstructed. And so when you forget where you just came from, then you have to start searching for that last location. Uh, so it's a, the point is that it's, it matters what sort of information you're storing in your head because that's gonna change what kind of support you might need from a tool in order to help you overcome these cognitive limitations. And there's a question in the chat. Do you check programs have a control flow? Uh, good question, we do. There's another experiment in the same Kai paper, if you wanna read it, where we looked at uh, working memory for people tracing function call graphs uh, and yeah, I, I won't describe too many details, but we do we do look, look a little bit into this in the in the paper. All right. And so the main takeaways from this particular study for me were that a uh, working memory does severely limit programmers from remembering its state while they're tracing a program. And you know these programs are contrived; they're not reflective of real programs that programmers deal with. But the point is more so to say, if you are creating a programming tool or you're giving someone a programming task that requires them to remember like the value of a variable or the location of a line of code, they're going to forget it, right? That's the law, right? These are kinds of information that people need to know for various programming tasks, and they're also going to forget it. And so uh, based on the different strategies that they're using, you wanna provide different kinds of cognitive support. So let's be more concrete. I think these are two really interesting examples of lesser known IDE features that provide cognitive support for both of these kinds of things. Uh, so this is a picture of an, sorry, it's a little washed out, but hopefully again, you can all see it. This is a picture from an interactive theorem prover. So I don't know if any of you have used like lean or cock or any of these kinds of things. And the way this works is this is um, like a proof of some statement. And if you click into any line of code here, then it'll show you in this pane the name and type of all variables that are in scope at the point where your cursor is, which in a theorem prover basically corresponds to the set of facts that are true at a given point in the proof. And this is really cool because if you are tracing linearly and you don't need to hold in your memory the set of things that are true in the rest of your proof, it is externalized into the editor to show you without you needing to hold that information in your head. Another example is this is the Dr. Racket IDE for the Racket programming language. And they have this cool little feature that's kind of cut off at the barrier of the screens, where if you hover over a variable like X here, it'll draw a line to all the places in the editor where that variable is used. And so if you were tracing on demand and you reached this variable and said, oh, I forgot where I just came from, right? Then at least this limits the scope of the possible places you would need to go back to. These are one of the five locations you could have been inspecting X from. And these are examples of cognitive support, how we can design tools to help people overcome the limitations of their memory. And more generally, as I've read through cognitive psychology literature and a lot of HCI literature, I think this is really one of the biggest intersections of like psychology and design that I've seen explored of how do we overcome our terrible working memories? And there's a lot of interesting ways that you can think about this to you know, relate back to the design of your own tool. So for instance, uh, one strategy that people use to improve the working memory is what's called chunking. So you know, I mentioned before that uh, we can store like four plus or minus one things, things in our working memory, but what those things are is not super well-defined. Uh, so, and what a clear effect that has been demonstrated in many areas of expertise is as you get better at that domain, you tend to group together related information into these chunks that you can hold in working memory and manipulate together. So like, for instance, uh, if you 
give novice programmers a bunch of programming language keywords and ask them to remember them back, uh, they'll actually remember them like lexicographically. So they'll say like if and int are more related to each other than bool and then. Whereas expert programmers will know that if and then being syntactic constructs that are commonly used together are sort of part of the same mental chunk, int and bool both being data types are also part of the same mental chunk. And so when you have these mental chunking strategies, they enable you to represent more abstract forms of information in your working memory that you can manipulate entirely in your head. Another form of cognitive support is schematization. So when you consider writing some piece of code, like this is a little snippet that opens uh, and, and reads a file or prints all the lines out of a file in Python, then uh, there, are, you know, there are less and more idiomatic ways to write code. And when we write code in idiomatic ways using patterns that are familiar to people, then this enables them to understand more quickly to perceive the structure of the code and to identify, ah, you know, when I, when I see with open as F, I've seen that pattern so many times that I understand this block of code is doing something about, you know, reading this file. Whereas when you don't use those patterns, it can take someone more time to sort of mentally reconstruct what's happening in the situation. So idiomatic, writing idiomatic code is a working memory strategy. Similarly, decomposition is a working memory strategy. So if you have like a really big problem, you say, how do I write a function, for instance, then breaking it down into pieces can help you because there are often too many details in solving a problem all at once. We have to think about it in working memory sized chunks so we can say, write the tests and then decide the type signature one at a time. But if we try to accomplish all of these things at once, it can be too much information to keep track of all of the constraints and it's difficult uh, without some kind of decomposition strategy. Another really popular tool is externalization. So uh, when you hold information in your head, right? Like for instance, you have the set of things you need to do today. A very common thing would be to write this down in a checklist. And this isn't just sort of a nice little optimization. This is the kind of thing where like nurses and hospitals, when they use checklists have been shown to statistically save more lives. Like people are fallible, they will forget things. And so the act of writing this information down somewhere and having it exist in an external form so you can reference that is like a cognitive superpower. Writing is overcoming the limitations of your memory. But the, the, re the representation of that information also matters. So for instance, uh, another tool in the programmer's toolbox is visualization. Like if I was trying to understand the performance profile of a program and I was just reading a bunch of like statistics about each function, it would be difficult to relate the, uh, each individual statistic to the overall picture of how a system is executing. But if I use something like a flame graph, which is a cool tool if you haven't used it, then it allows you to get the high level picture and then drill down on the specifics so you can sort of see in your mind's eye the overall behavior of the system, which would be difficult to reconstruct in your working memory from the lower level statistics. And finally, you know, really the most popular working memory strategy used by programmers today is automation, which is I take some task I would normally have to think about, like, oh, did I use a particular pointer correctly, right? Or am I violating some invariant of the system? And you uh, automate that process by creating a compiler or a type checker or a linter or a formatter or something that just takes care of it. It, it, it uh, does that process automatically. And thereby, you don't. it's not something you need to keep in your head. And, and really, I think there's a story of software engineering and programming language design that can be told through a cognitive lens. The history of tools that we've created are often with the purpose of enabling individual software engineers to like tackle larger and larger problems, to deal with larger and larger systems while still not having to keep every detail of the system in their head all at once. And so as promised, these are all cognitive design principles. Uh, these are concrete ideas that, that you can use as you are going in designing tools, editors, languages, systems, curricula and so on to think about when somebody is, is doing something in programming and how are they using their working memory and what strategy can we adopt to try and help them overcome it. So I'll, I'll pause here for questions. Uh, any, any, any questions about this? Any, any follow-ups or things I want to clarify? Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, like, based off your previous study where you looked at the pupil movements or like the movement tracking. Yeah. Um, like, are you trying to optimize programming languages to be like adaptive for users or is it like optimizing based off like patterns? 
Can you summarize the question first for the mic? Oh, sure. Uh, yes, the, the question was, is the goal of the research to kind of identify, if, if I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit, is the goal of the research to identify patterns in usage of these tools such, such that, like, we could help people then, like, like, mm, trying to think. Can you, can, you, can, you, can you say the question one more time? I want to make sure I understand. Yeah, so like if you're building like a human centered programming language, yes. are you trying to optimize the, the compiler for the person or is it like adapting to oh, I see. the usage? Right, right, right. So, so if you're trying to build a human centered programming language, are you optimizing the compiler for the person or somehow adapted to the individual usage? So, uh, you know, one thing I will say is there's different levels at which you can design a system, right? Holding a programming language constant, you can improve the editor. Uh, and uh, you know, a good example of this in something like uh, Rust is when you have a function that has positional arguments, so you say like f of ABC, then the by default, you don't know what the names of each of those arguments are, because that's how positional arguments work. But your editor, so if, if the language doesn't require you to write them down, then that's information that's missing, but your editor could say, insert that information back in. So like VS Code will actually do this in languages like Rust and OCaml and others, where it'll like add the ghost name of the parameters of each of these functions that you're calling uh, as a form of support. So you don't have to look that up in the documentation, for instance. Um, so I think one, one uh, idea here is to, is to adapt the editor to all of these kind of cognitive holes in the, in the usage of, of these tools. Because and another instance of this would be, say, like error messages. So right now, when you use a programming language, you get a one-size-fits-all error message. Whether you're a novice or an expert, you have the same interface in the compiler, which is probably not ideal. So I think that's another interesting case where ideally there'd be some notion of, of adapting to the uh, experience level of the user. So when you're dealing with novices, you might use different vocabulary. You might use fewer uh, terms of art, fewer jargon that's specific to the, to the language, and then add, ramp that up as they learn more and say, oh, you know what this term is, so I'm going to start using it inside of this context. So, you know, I think there's opportunities for both, but it depends on, oftentimes it's a system design challenge of like, what are you holding constant? Am I allowing myself to change the language? Am I changing the diagnostics? Or am I changing the editor? And then sort of filling in how you're going to adapt to, or, and, and then also deciding the axis of adaptation. Like, am I adapting to people who come from like Python or C++? Am I adapting to people who've had, you know, one versus 10 years of programming experience? And then once you fix all of those constraints, then there's sort of then you can work uh, on a very specific design challenge. Uh, I'm not sure that's exactly answering your question, but those are just kind of some related thoughts on uh, ways in which you can either change the language or the system around it to accomplish these goals of, of providing cognitive support to programmers. Gotcha. And then can I ask a follow-up? Yeah, of course. Um, so, like to clarify, like along those lines, per se, you were building a programming language for like. Well, let's go back to your first example, like you're designing a programming language for like quantum computing. Yeah. And there's people who haven't touched quantum and there are experts in it who've been studying for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know that you've collected enough user experience data on like any subset to be able to then create the most efficient? Right, yeah. So the question is, how do you know when you've collected enough user experience data to justify any particular design decision, right? And well, and, you know, part of my goal, right, is to say you don't need to necessarily collect data at all. I think there are lots of interesting decisions you can justify from first principles of cognition. No, because in a sense, like we have data from just general psychological experimentation about things like working memory that we can use to form theories to predict how people will say read a program or trace a program or things like that without actually having real people do that. Um, but then once you do start gathering that data, because that's intended to be a first step, but not like the entire story of it. Uh, like it's it's the same, I think it's the same thing of all forms of iterative design. Like I, I think the challenge with programming languages is that because you often have a commitment to backwards compatibility, it's something you need to get right early on. And design, design decisions you make early based on incomplete data can then come back and bite you a long time down the, down the road. And you're like, well, we can't change this, the syntax or this feature or whatever because it would break everyone's code. So, uh, but conversely, like people who do programming language design right now gather no data. They go purely based on intuition when they decide how to make new features. So, I mean, in, in that sense, I would say any data is better than no data. You know, and 
but and in particular, you you want to try and I probably collect as much data as you could to justify something. Um, and, you know, there, there are, depending on how you constrain the task, right, there are like statistical ways to kind of identify, we're sort of capping out the amount of data, we, you know, we're like, if we're trying to estimate like how long it would take someone to do something, for instance, you know, there are error bars on that, and those error bars will get smaller and smaller as the size of your participant pool grows, and eventually you'll say, I think any, uh, you know, the marginal value of any additional participant will not reduce those error bars significantly, right? And like we we did that for the tracing experiments where we recruited participants until we saw that there the effects we were were not expecting to see were statistically significant, and then you stop at that point. That's a sort of adaptive experimental design. So I think there are also more quantitative ways you can do this. If if there's like specific metrics you're trying to estimate, and you have a sense of the, the confidence intervals on those metrics, you can just say, well, you know, those intervals are small enough that I think we've gathered, gathered enough data. But that's also very different from the much more qualitative sense of like. Would this feature be useful in practice? You can't really put error bars on that. And so that's a, a purely intuitive judgment right now. Yeah. A question on Zoom mm -hmm. from Professor. Oh, on Zoom. Oh, yeah. Hello. 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 Uh, a very Hi. interesting talk. Uh, I have a, I mean, uh, I have basically two questions. One is, I feel, uh, so, you know, nowadays, a lot of this automated tool is coming up like GitHub Copilot, et cetera, et cetera, for making programming yeah. tasks easier. So I am wondering that the kind of, I mean, the your first few slides where you showed how developers' attention move, do you think that kind of cognitive attention can be tracked by, say, a uh, machine learning model to give attention and then make the job easier? Hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. I actually saw a really cool paper the other day that uh, compared the actual attention of programmers reading a piece of code to the like sort of machine learning attention of a machine learning model attempting to produce an explanation of the same code and seeing if you could use the difference in those distributions to inform like, ah, it seems that the machine learning model is attending to irrelevant things more than the programmers are. So that's a little bit in a different direction. That's more like using a model of human comprehension to try and make a machine model better. Um, but certainly, you know, I think there are lots of opportunities for machine learning in this space. Uh, so, you know, one, yeah, as you're saying, one idea is if you produce some kind of computational model that can guess like where people are going to read in a program, for instance, then maybe you could suggest, like you could imagine a, a linter that would look at your program and say, hey, people are likely going to spend 30% of their time reading your code this way. Uh, and actually, here's a concrete example of this. So based on these working memory studies, I would predict that uh, imagine two forms of code, one where you declare every single variable you're going to use in one block at the top of your function, or one where you declare the variable right before it gets used. And so and these are actually two real styles you can find out in the world. Uh, like early C code was much more of a former style where you like declare everything at the beginning and then you do all the stuff with those variables. I would predict based on the working memory theory that the latter style of co-locating the definition of a variable and its usage is cognitively preferable because someone reading that program needs to hold fewer variables in their working memory at, at, at any given point in time. They don't need to say, ah, oh, there's like 15 things going on and they need to track all of them simultaneously. And so that would suggest that, and, and you could probably write a linter that would automatically say, hey, the like average distance between where variables are defined and used in your function is too far. And therefore our like tracing model predicts that this would be hard for people to read. I think you could definitely uh, build tools, formatters, linters uh, in that style. And certainly as these models get more sophisticated, we can make increasingly interesting judgments about like, ah, the model just thinks this code might be hard to read. I don't know why it says it might be hard to read. You should go check it out and you could prompt it for an explanation even. There are folks that are looking into that, but the models are pretty unreliable at this point. So it's unclear if like just sort of black boxing it will be a, an effective strategy, which is part of the reason I think that drawing it from cognitive first principles, it can be useful because you have a, a mechanistic or causal explanation of why something is going to be difficult as opposed to just a correlational explanation of, we saw this in our training set and so we think it might be challenging for instance. Thank you. Uh, do I have time for another quick question? Absolutely. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I am also wondering what is your thought on visualization? Because if I use visualization for development aid, like developers aid, uh, 
so the way say i will show uh like suggest say a possible token will be very different than say uh, showing data dependency or abstract syntax tree right so do you have hmm. any thought on that yeah so i so so i think visualization is an underexplored area of programming in general because the only visualization really that we use in a sense is syntax highlighting. That's the main visual aid that we provide for people reading source code, as well as the, the indentation-based structure of, of source code syntax. But there are very few other visual aids we provide. Like the flame graph I mentioned is, is notable in being one of the few visualizations of program behavior that has somewhat widespread use. But I think there's uh, a lot of open space to think about how we can better like, I think the challenge is often that visualizations are hard to scale. You can come up with a program that you can visualize that is, say, four to five lines long, maybe 10 lines long. But as soon as you have like 30 variables, if you replace every one of those variables with an arrow, you'd end up with the most tangled nest of code you could possibly imagine. And this is true in a lot of visual programming environments, as I'm sure our Max MSB expert can attest, right? Uh, it's really hard. Like, in some sense, text is one of the few mediums that we have that allows us to stay sane in the face of complexity. And so I think that there's a kind of cognitive slash design challenge of finding the right task that is amenable to visualization and that programmers would benefit from a visualization. Because um, there have been a lot of attempts to build things like software cities and like crazy things for showing code bases in every form imaginable that, have, to my understanding, just not been super successful thus far. So. I have some more thoughts on this uh, in terms of Rust, which is something we're looking at right now. So I'll get into that at the end of the talk, but it's a, yeah, it's definitely a great area for research right now, I think. Thank you, All right. really interesting talk. Absolutely. So I had a demo for this tool. Uh, I can show you briefly, just in, for, to, to like pique your interest. Um, let me see, where's, where's it in here? The, there's a ton of detail to show about this, but I just want to mention one kind of working memory tool I've been interested in for a long time is how do you help programmers take big pieces of code and turn them into more manageable chunks based on your specific tasks. And so the specific thing that I implemented is a VS Code extension that can take any Rust program, and then you can click a specific variable and then gray out all the parts of the code that have no effect on that variable. Um, and so the idea is this is like a debugging tool you could use to sort of take a big function, you know, decompose it into a smaller function, externalize that information into your editor, and then automatically use the dependency graph to like reduce the scope of, of a debugging problem you have at a given point in time. Uh, I'm tossing that out there. So if any of you are interested, come ask me afterwards, because I have a, a lot to say about that, but we don't have enough time. So I'm going to skip right through all that. Ba, 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 ba. Great. And we have about 13 minutes. I want to just also briefly mention the other side of the talk, which is about mental models that I think is really interesting. Let me reshare the screen. Right, so as I mentioned, you know, the underlying question here was still, how do we use theories of human behavior to design and evaluate programming tools? And thus far, I've mostly focused on working memory and how you can use that to understand what makes programming difficult and how to better design a tool with it in mind. But I also want to talk about uh, working memory is still very low level. Right? It's, it's a very primitive sort of a fact is in your head, and we want to think about when there's too many facts in your head. But we, we want to be able to talk about higher levels of cognition as well. And a concrete example of this uh, is learning. So a specific challenge that I'm working on in my postdoc right now is thinking about how do we make programming languages easier to learn. Uh, and a particular language that is really gnarly for people to learn is called Rust. So Rust is a like C++ competitor. It's a systems programming language. and it's noted for being, it's, it sort of tries to make C++ safe by using a fancy type system to make sure you don't treat yourself in the foot. But at the same time, it can then be very frustrating to program in. And there are lots of people who say things like, ah, I'm losing hope to ever learn this language. For Christ's sake, it can't be so hard to implement a linked list. That's a very challenging experience, partially because real languages just have tons of features that all interact in very confusing ways. And creating a consistent mental model of how all of these features work is a fascinating and difficult challenge that as all of you learners of programming languages understand can take a long time. And just to give you a sense of a very concrete problem, we've been thinking about uh, how misconceptions arise of features. So for example, in Rust, uh, if 
there's this idea of ownership, which is if I say have a string, so I say like let s is some string, and then I say let s2 is equal to s, what this does is it transfers ownership of this value, the string, from s to s2. And so it's actually a compiler error to use this variable right here. You're not allowed to print s after ownership has been transferred to s2. Uh, and, and if you go read the actual book on Rust, it will tell you about these things. It'll say, hey, this is how ownership works in Rust. But then we've tried a little experiment where we have people read this book, they see this example, and then we show them another example and say, if we let's say we change this program, and instead of uh, doing let s2 equals s on its own, we wrap that in if false curly brace and curly brace. So this code is no longer actually executed. And we ask people, do you think this program will compile? Uh, and most people predict that this program, while the, the program on the top does not, and we tell them that, they'll think the program on the bottom does. They'll say, oh yeah, of course, because the sort of like, I, I, they have a dynamic model of how this like checker works, this ownership checker. They'll say, well, this code would never get executed. I'm sure the compiler is smart enough to figure that out. And therefore it's totally fine to use this string here. But in fact, if you actually wrote this code in Rust, the compiler would reject this program. And the reason for that is the way that Rust does static analysis and how a lot of type systems tend to work is it doesn't actually see the condition here. It like ignores the false and says, well, it could, I'm not going to ever try and guess whether the that thing is definitely false or not. And so instead, I'm just going to assume that branch could always be taken. And therefore, this is definitely an ownership violation. And the, and the point is, that is a surprising thing for a lot of people. Like we were seeing this in the experiments that were running, that people, uh, the, the text of these, of these books, the resources that are being used to, to give people a mental model of this like programming language feature are insufficient to prevent these misconceptions from arising. And so the question we've been asking now for the last couple of months is how do we systematically identify misconceptions of these programming languages? And then more importantly, how do we modify the learning resources to target those specific misconceptions? And the, I think in the, in the themes of the talk, right? What, the thing I always think about in, in research is how do we learn from the work that other people have done to make our own work more effective? And I talked about cognitive psychology as being the main insight for thinking about working memory. But when we're talking about learning now, we're at a much higher level of cognition, and we need to talk about uh, learning science, of which there is a fairly robust literature about how people learn and ways to make forms of learning more effective. So for instance, uh, specifically in physics, there's been a ton of work about what makes New Newtonian mechanics and many physics concepts difficult for people. So like there's this test called the forced concept inventory where you, you have problems like this, like I'm spinning in a circle and then this ball releases from, snaps off my little rope. Uh, and then which direction does it go, right? People get this wrong at, at alarming rates uh, even after they've taken a physics course. And so this is, these kinds of questions are really useful for ferrying out like what, what happens and why does it happen that somebody would predict, so the correct answer here being the tangent by the way, um, but like even after taking a physics course, some people incorrectly predict uh, E, maybe because they're thinking this is an issue of like some tri centrifugal force or some other unrelated physics phenomenon um, that doesn't apply in the setting. And so there's been a lot of research about how do we then improve the, the teaching of physics to overcome these like naive theories of, of physics that students are still keeping after their course. And so I'll give you two examples. Uh, one interesting example is, is called bridging analogies. So if I was trying to explain static normal forces in physics, like I might say, hey, uh, having my hand on this spring on, a, on top of the surface is actually the same conceptual thing as having a book on this shelf in terms of the static normal forces being exerted on each object in this equation. But people often see that these, these situations look so different, they don't understand the relationship between them. And so the pedagogy being explored in this study was if we like interpolate the analogical space between these two things. So for instance, if we describe a book on a hammock as something that is springy, but still book-like, then when, you, when, when you're changing a smaller number of things between each pair of examples, people can transfer their knowledge and say, ah, I see why this situation is kind of like this. And this situation one is kind of like this. So it's easier to transfer knowledge from A to B. And these are not just sort of speculations. When you run studies, you teach people in one way versus another, that 
you know, when presented with these intermediate examples versus just both of the end, the start and the end, that, that people get like one standard deviation greater learning gains uh, with this style of pedagogy. So these are examples of interventions that work, ways of creating examples of phenomena you're trying to compare. Another really fascinating example uh, is about, about invention. So there was this cool study at Stanford where they had students learn about density. So they said, uh, in one case, I'll just tell you what the formula for density is, like D is equal to mass divided by volume. And then they give you a worksheet. I say, uh, here's some clowns in cars. I want you to compute the density of these clown cars. So I give you a formula, you get practice using that formula. But then in the alternative condition, what they test is that they, they don't give you the formula for density. They, they tell you what density is like. So for instance, they might say, an ideal density metric should know that this clown car is denser than this clown car, but I want you to come up with an equation that justifies that, which, so they, they have a whole notion of like an index and so on. Um, and they have people invent for themselves the concept of density. And what's fascinating is then if you test P as students in both of these conditions about density, they'll do equally well, they all get density. But then when you give them a distinct physics phenomenon that also involves the ratio of two quantities. So for instance, um, the, uh, the stiffness of an elastic material also is like the ratio of two different things. Then what they find is the students who went through the inventing condition do significantly better in learning this new concept because I arguably they're transferring a deeper knowledge of the underlying mathematical structure of this formula to a new situation rather than just having learned this sort of like raw formula itself and being able to only apply it when they see the same concept of density. So that's really cool. And again, this is like a standard deviation learning game when they try and put people in these, in these new situations. And so the thing that we're starting to think about is how can we take these ideas and then generate a pedagogy from them for uh, programming languages like Rust. And so as a concrete example, if I wanted to dispel that misconception of how like ownership works with regards to these if statements, then you can think about, well, first we need to be really systematic about the set of examples that we picked. We wanted to tell people about this. I, I wanna show people an if statement. I wanna have both a false and a true condition so they understand that the value of the condition doesn't matter. And I also might wanna include an if and an else because this program actually does compile by the way, since the compiler can reason about the fact that this print will never run uh, after this wet binding has, and therefore ownership has been transferred here, but not here. Uh, and so it's, and it's particularly interesting then to also say, how do you get people to engage with these examples? If I just show them to you, I have no idea what's going on in your head. I need to explicitly scaffold the process by which you go through interpreting each of these. So I might say first, I want you to invent, you know, like, what do you think is going to happen in each of these cases? Come up with like a consistent policy that would, you know, reject or accept some set of these programs. And then you can tell them the actual policy to compare it against their invented one. And then further draw their attention to the most salient difference being like, this thing you might think works, but doesn't. And this thing does work, even though you might think it's, even though you might think it's otherwise the same as, as the example above it. And so we haven't actually tried this yet. I'm in the process of deploying this kind of explanation to people who are learning, learning Rust right now. But yeah, and that's kind of part of the idea is like, I can derive, these sorts of explanations, like there are, there are principles I think that we can learn from. This isn't just a purely ad hoc or intuitive thing to say, I'm gonna try and teach this based on my intuitive notion of what's best for learning, right? I think there are real principles we can gain from the literature here to make these things more effective. Okay, that's about all I have time for. Uh, so I'll just leave this slide up if you wanna review what we talked about in this lecture. And again, the, the high level idea is just how do we use theories of human behavior to design and evaluate programming tools? And I've explored uh, a couple instances in this direction, and I would love to chat with all of you about it uh, if you have any questions. So thanks for listening. And we have two minutes for any remaining questions. One question in the chat. Oh, all right. Question in the chat. Do you think such misconceptions in Rust lead to bugs? Great question. Uh, so in the context of Rust, I think it's interesting because oftentimes, no, these misconceptions lead to the compiler rejecting your program. And so in some sense, that's good because your misconception doesn't lead to like a production program crashing, but it leads to frustration at 
at the time you're writing the program of like, why can't I get the compiler to, to let my program pass through? I just want to test this thing out. So I think it's it's more like people never are able to write their programs in the first place and then they give up on the language entirely. That's the danger of these misconceptions. And this is unsafe us in which case it might that's right. That's why we don't teach people about unsafe rust. <laughs> So uh, I think uh, my student Vikram, Vikram, you just talked, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, well, I won't have. I mean, today, unfortunately, to talk to you, but Vikram will talk to you, and he will uh, describe our experience with Rust. I think one oh, of the, one of the thing uh, can be. I mean, we can uh, discuss later you know how the examples you are showing can aid in static analysis explanation. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and this is, so going back to your point about visualization, this is something we're also exploring right now is how do you visualize the static facts inferred by the compiler to help explain why someone would encounter one of these errors. Right. We that have work be, that's maybe yeah. about a month out from being something I could publicly show. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, we're thinking about this problem a lot right now. So uh, I just wanted to say that Rust actually does a very good job of doing this when it gives you compiled bugs, right? It says that value borrowed on this line, but then used again here and the lifetime doesn't. So I, I feel like Rust sort of is very transparent about why it's getting a particular error as compared to any other language like C or Python. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about it, um, which we, because uh, we're meeting later today. Right? Yes. Okay, yeah, uh, we'll have a, a very good discussion on Rust error messages. But anyways, we're at 1130. I don't want to keep any of you any longer. So again, thanks for coming and hope we get to chat with some of you throughout the day. Thank you. Thanks everyone on Zoom. All right, awesome. So we'll give ourselves a few minutes before we...